Okay, now it's time for this week's Continental Tyres question of the week. You can, you can talk rugby with the four esteemed panellists, or you can talk God knows what with the one on the end. Um, if there are any questions, we've got mics floating around, we can just shout them out and we'll repeat them back. But if you've all had enough, yes, my friend, shout it out. It's a lovely Mike burgundy from... shirt you got there, yeah, sir. Like Chloe lent it to me. Too. Oh, did she? <laughs> she likes a man of burgundy. Oh, she does. Oi, oi. She probably did. Fucking hell. She probably did. I. I... I'd, not, I'd start now if I were you. Yeah. I'd make a run for it. It's all right. He can't fucking run anymore. You're safe. Just oh, walk You've got away with that, yeah. He's got the guest list, though, so he'll go through it. <laughs> CCTV. This is going to be a hell of a question, my friend, because you've come in hot. Oh, yeah. um, I know that France's hand has been forced with the Olympics, but do you think other, other countries might start doing a similar thing where it's not just Twickenham that has English rugby? Do we see that happening? Do we see France doing it in the future as well? He's gone with a very safe question. He's gone with a very... Would you like to see England play their games around the country? Um, the problem is the RFU won't do it uh, because obviously uh, another stadium, you have to pay for the stadium and it takes into their profits. Uh, we did it once back We've done it in Newcastle, Huddersfield. Uh, yeah, we to. played at Old, Old Trafford. You played at Old Trafford. Um, so I think it has been done. I just don't... I don't think France would do it if... if they didn't have to renovate the stadium. But they don't own Stade de France, do no. they? No, FFR. they certainly so don't. They rent it out. They yeah, so it. it's different for them, whereas it's the main revenue generator for the RFU, so I'm not entirely sure they would do it. I don't think, you know, obviously Ireland only did it when they had to, uh, when they re when they redid the Aviva. So. Plus the city doesn't count. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they were both in Dublin. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true, but different stadiums. But it was good, though, yeah, back in Croke really Park. I wish We never won yeah. there, but, you know. Yeah. I wish you still play. I know, I know all the political history, but Croker is a hell of a stadium. Yeah, yeah, we had good memories there as well. But you know, similar Sma smashing England being yeah, top yeah, of the yeah. list. Yeah, Ireland, Scotland, twenty ten. Oh, hello! Look at that. So, always chippy, always <laughs> chipping away, chip, chip, chip. Keep an eye on the Premiership final because I think that might be the one that starts moving around the country. But good question. Anyone else got a question? Do you want to shout it out? By the time we've got a microphone, to oh, 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 I tell you what. Hang on, we'll come to this gentleman, then we'll come back up to you, my friend. Yes, sir. What's yours? So rugby's on a downward spiral in terms of viewers, etc., and clubs disappearing. Keep it what light. Think... Keep it light. <laughs> what What do you think the respective RVUs could do to help grow the game? That's a very good question. Who wants to go first? Well, it's it's downhill. No disrespect, huh? In England. <laughs> no, no, but I don't mean it in a, in a bad way. But in France, it's absolutely not the case. Uh, and and France are absolutely not perfect, and it's not been fantastic for over the last twenty years. It took us a long, long time with some bad sides that. Uh, you know, clubs were overly powerful and then it cost us for the national side. So I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm just saying it is growing. Uh, th things are getting a little bit uh, uh, more exciting. There's, there's, you know, there's the USA that's still going to be a potential avenue for rugby to grow. And I think those boundaries needs to be stretched. There's a real, uh, everybody I know was particularly pissed off about uh, South Africans joining, you know, the EPCR and all those competitions. In the end, they are very, very good sides uh, and they're offering some pretty, um, you know, tough oppositions. And the end, the players are, are growing. I don't know about the English, but all the French were absolutely ecstatic about going down to Cape Town in December for a week to play all those games under the sun coming back you know so it's just uh, creating something different we're creatures that don't really like change but overall hopefully once we get the ball rolling a little bit it will be I generally hope that England will, will manage to get fine and in order rugby is still a uh, is still a sport that can generate something absolutely unique it can you know teach normal human beings to sort of behave normally uh, and, and and to grow up it can be an avenue to channel some, you know, inner madness that you want to, you know, put into uh, playing with your mates. So it still has a tremendous amount of, of value, whatever, whatever is professional or not. And that can be extracted. Maybe it went a little bit too far, too quick for England. Uh, it took a long time for France to get its shit uh, sorted. But all the top 14 games, there's 29,000 people going to watch uh, every game at Bordeaux at the moment. It's a football stadium and it's rammed, right? So it's doable. It's doable. I, I played in Leicester Tigers in 2007, uh, from 2007 to 2009. Welford Road, a bloody amazing stadium, was ram-packed with 25,000 people uh, every single game. So I think it's there. It can be made. It's not all gloom and doom. Uh, it's just a lot of work needs to be put into it. Come on, round of applause. <laughs> yes, my friend, up, up there. Given the, uh, given the state of Australian rugby at the moment, is there going to be a proper series in the Lions? Is it, is it going to work? Interesting. I'm going to come to you because I think everybody would have said no until 
Joe Schmidt. Smoking Joe Schmidt comes in. Yeah. And a, that's a lovely subplot between the master and the apprentice. And yeah, it is. It's a really and, nice little angle. And it that. needed something, didn't it? Yeah. You know, because we were all, I think everyone shared the same um, trepidation that it's a, it becomes a blowout. Um, Australian rugby, we talk about issues. Australian rugby has major, major issues. There's not enough people playing, but and they've lost their identity. They were the innovators. They were the sort of you know, intellectual powerhouse of rugby right the way through from sort of, you know, early 80s right the way through until maybe, you know, after Eddie left, really, wasn't it? Everything that was generated in rugby, you were doing, yes, the All Blacks were always there, but I thought, so, I thought you know, between 85 and certainly, you know, 2000, everybody was copying um, the Wallabies, you know, because they were the ones that were thinking outside the box and playing the best rugby and playing the most exciting rugby and, and the most challenging rugby. So they've, they've sort of lost their direction. Um, they need, they've, like, I know they have a new strategy they're developing at the moment to increase the, the numbers of players. That's a long-term strategy. But it depends what sort of Joe Smith they get. If they get the Joe Smith that I was exposed to when he was with Leinster, he was you know, amazingly compelling, innovative, playing, you know, challenging you to play brilliant rugby, wanting you to play brilliant rugby. And we played really exciting rugby with Leinster. But, you know, later stage, Joe Smith is, you know, w was pretty boring. You know, the game plan, I don't think changed that much, but the players were so inhibited that they never threw the offload. They never took the wide option. It was just about retaining the ball and rugby had moved on and has moved on since then. And I don't know how much, you know, Sheen, um, you know, that last few years has taken off Joe. I think you know, we heard good reports about New Zealand, but you wouldn't have thought that New Zealand side, you didn't see Joe's fingerprints all over it. So, you know, if you get early stage Joe um, for the Wallabies, no, even with the players they have, they'll be competitive. But if, um, if he, you know, if we see that later stage, Joe, it will be a blowout and it will be, a, it will not be good for, for, for Lions rugby. But I think on that, Joe Smith took Ireland to number one and then the pressure changes. Whereas I think he's picking up a team where no one's expecting anything. And I think he can do what he did by just implementing. He's got a young group of players out there in Australia. He can really, I think, I think he can really make an actual shift on how they approach the game, how they play the game. I think Eddie obviously got it completely wrong and um, well, basically was, yeah, just got it wrong. And I think, Baez, I think Joe Smith can come in there and give them some guidance about getting them back to just being, being more pragmatic about how, how they play, but also using that flair and having, cause it's quite a nice place to be where no one's expecting anything of you that you can go and find that balance. Mm. Um, whereas, uh, you know, when, when you're number one in the world, uh, as Ireland were back in 2015 and people expect everything, you try and protect that. And I don't think he, he doesn't need to do that when he goes into Australia. We shall see. Watch this space. Yes, my friend. You got a microphone. We'll come to you just in a moment. Yes, my friend. Um, so I'm about halfway through the Netflix uh, documentary. Uh, I'm loving it. I'm assuming most people in this room are loving it, but we're not the audience that it needs to hit if to grow the game. Some people on the panel are involved in the program. It's had some bad reviews from non-rugby TV critics. Those who've watched it on the panel, do they think that it's going to do what we want it to do? Or is it just going to be end up being something that is of interest to everybody in this room and people who go to, go to rugby generally? All I hope is the strongest thing and the best thing about I think the players on the pitch are giving everything this game needs to make it a success. It's failing because of the people who run it off the field. And that's... And that, and that's the unions. That's the fifty-seven old farts. It's the unions. It's the, it's the PR. It's the countless different bodies that we have who want to take their piece out of the game, and we need a radical change. This is mainly in England because I agree. In France, it's built the club up, so people are passionate about the clubs that they play for. And then the international team suffered for a long time until they finally got their shit together and actually. Whereas at the moment. Our game, Australia's game, New Zealand's game, uh, South Africa's game in some respects. No one goes to South African rugby because of the deal that they've got for TV. It's built on international. Our international game is off the charts. The Rugby World Cup is the third biggest watch sporting event in the world. We have 12, 9 to 12 million people who've, who come in and watch um, the Six Nations, A, because it's uh, free to wear and everything else like that. And then we can't get 30,000 30, to watch 
TNT or whatever. That, so yeah. that is that is the problem, is the fact that we, we are built the wrong way around. If you look at the NRL in, in Australia, if you look at the NFL, it's built around the... I know obviously the NFL don't have an international game. It's built around the strength of the club. Football, the brand is in the club. And then, and then that leads to the international. And at the moment, where an international sport, again, it's respective. I think Ireland's different because they have four regions that come together and they perform pretty well all the time. Uh, I think that is where we have come around. And until we radically, and it means like knocking it down and rebuilding it, we're going to struggle on that part. I think it's, I think it's the first step as well, and a, a really positive step for rugby to be able to get top panel on Netflix. You know, we've seen it with Drive to Survive. Nobody really cared about Formula One that much. And then suddenly you get to see some of the personalities and the interest in in that game, in that sport, elevated massively. Rugby's got the opportunity in that space. But I think COVID, pro, you know, hurt a lot of business around the world. The, the business of rugby was one that suffered massively because it was already stretching at the seams. And I think off the back of it, probably pre-COVID, I reckon Six Nations probably would have said no to that the, the, the documentary. As it is, they've said yes because they understand the need to grow the game. And I think now the personalities have got to get out. I think COVID asked a lot of questions of a lot of clubs. And sadly, you know, a couple have gone to the wall within the Premiership. But on the flip side, you look at the festive games, big game 15, sold out Twickenham. You looked at... Bristol had 25, 26,000 down the road. There is an appetite for the sport. It just needs to be important to to more people more of the time. And we need, you know, it's, it's an end to end. It's from kids because, you know, now with the headlines around head injuries and so on, parents, typically mothers, understandably so, as a as a, as a dad of two two kids, my, my, my wife still wants our boys to play rugby because she's she sees how much it, it, it gives young kids and, Idiots like me, um, but and I think it's got to be end to end. There's got to, it's got to be exciting. It's got to be something that people can engage with. I think it's got to be understandable, and you've got to change change the game and the narrative around it and the stories that are told on rugby. Um, you know, in American football, how many people tune into NFL and actually know what's happening? And it's like, oh, it's a flag. Oh, it's a, it's, it's like a defensive penalty, and it's like, right, that's enough. I don't need to know any, anything more. Like scrum penalty, get get the game back going. Like we, we don't want to see 10 reset scrums um, at a time. All of the nuance of Fenders, rugby, is, it kind of holds it back in, in some ways. Um, so I think it just needs to be simplified or the way that we communicate it and tell the stories is simplified. And, the, you know, I think the game can can pick up from a, from a, a, a relatively high bar for start. We also need to actually accept what our USP is. Yeah, I agree with that. And it's, it's physicality. Oh, 100%. And, and we stop eat, trying to be we all things trying to, be to all things for all people because one of the best games in the World Cup was Ireland versus South Africa. Why? Because of the physicality. It was called a test match for a reason. So it's supposed to test you physically, mentally, and what you've got in your soul. And that is the unique thing about rugby. Why it's the ultimate team sport is because it tests people through every part of their being. And... That's what we need to just accept, is it? Now we've got to, yes, get better of what goes before that in terms of looking after our players and making sure they're supported after the game. But there's no other physical contact sport that goes, oh my God, we need to change this, we need to change this because of how it's perceived and everything else. Accept what it is. We've got rid of all the malice, I think, out of the game. There aren't people you know, doing the dark arts of the way it was in the past. And we've just then got to accept that it's a collision-based sport and, and sometimes things happen. The day that we get a red card for someone tripping over someone and standing on someone's head in a Champions Cup game that then ends up losing them the game is quite sad. In also, my we, we need to stop beating ourselves up over this, actually. Yeah. Like, we 100% need all the um, the measures that have taken, uh, that have come in to, to limit, um, you know, concussions and, and address that. But also, people love rugby because of the physical nature of it. They always have and they always will. And we need to lean into that. And even the way we market it, not to be afraid of it. Yes, you know, we're protecting people. Also, the game of um, professional rugby is different than kids' rugby or club rugby. Mm. Just accept that, you know. And actually, in some ways, it's actually not healthy to be a professional rugby player. But it's not healthy to do loads of jobs, do you know. And if you take away the you know, most extreme elements of it, and, and, and get, don't get me wrong, the head injuries and concussions are that but lean into the physical nature, people will embrace it like they have NFL and, and other sports. And that, and that is, I, I am certain of that. The other thing that we need to do is, at the simplification point, 
We do need to make it more accessible for people who don't know rugby and you don't need to know every single rule and you don't uh, and it, it's still enjoyable. That's that's really important to take um that out of it. And then I would say and you know, I think we need to ditch largely video replays as well. Oh, man. It's killing us. It's so, so it's killing that moment of passion that we all grew up with where we see someone diving for the corner and, you know, they score the try and everyone cheers and everyone screams and it's brilliant. Instead, it's like nobody, nobody cheers because they're waiting to see whether it's a try or not. Listen, if you want to be, if there's something in the act of, of scoring, then fine. But this idea of going back 25 plays because someone's held someone's arm, that's a nonsense. That's what we liked about rugby. That was it. The part of rugby was getting away with that. That's part of the skill of it. That's part of the skill so of it. So we've just said it here, Island cheat. <laughs> I knew it! And on that bombshell, I think it's a really good question. I'll give you a couple of bits very anecdotally. I think the second series is already booked for six uh, full contact, which is brilliant news. I've got an 11-year-old who watched the whole thing front to back without picking up his phone, and they are all talking about it. it. I think it's on its way. I think if you look at Jamie George and how he is talking now, I think the players are incredibly conscious that they've got a big job on their hands, to, particularly in England, to reconnect with the fans. They're talking about how they engage supporters. They want more time after the game to go and sign take selfies, etc. They want a longer walk into the stadium. And the final thing is, back to Shane's point, particularly in the Premiership, I think they recognise now that rugby has got to get back to why every single one of us in this room played it, watch it, love it. It has a very, very special spirit to it. And I think that rugby, particularly in the Premiership, they're going to start getting after that a little bit more and stop diluting the story, stop trying to be all things to all people and end up being nothing to anyone. I think rugby is it particularly at the moment is about to go back to what it has been, what it is and what it should be. And if they can do that, hopefully the comeback for the sport is very much on. 